Good evening, everyone, and welcome. So good to see everyone tonight. What a grand opportunity we have to come and to worship together. Didn't we have a nice rain? I hope we took the time to give thanks to that, to God for that nice rain that we had today. That sort of made our bean crop up here, didn't it? <clears throat> All right. So tonight, um, after we have our class, we do need some help putting up the tables and chairs and putting the red chairs back out. So if you could stay just a few minutes afterwards and help with that, we sure would appreciate it. We do have some announcements that we'll follow up with. Clarence Kirby is now at home after a hospital stay. Miss Glenda Taylor is in rehab in Nashville. Miss Ann Byron is still in the Greenwood Nursing and Rehab Center. Jana Hammock is um, undergoing some tests this week. We have not heard from Martha Gale's test. Jack Raymer, who's the father-in-law of Erica Small, isn't doing too well. Adian Thomas, uh, they, uh, the grandson of Miss Shirley, uh, they uh, are going to see a neurologist for him. So. Then uh, this coming Sunday, uh, we're going to have the 21st annual sing. It's hard to believe that we've been doing that for 21 years, isn't it? And if you're flying into the current Metropolitan Airport and need a ride to the church, it will be provided. So just let us know about that. You can Uber if you need a ride out there, please let us know. We are excited about that. I hope you can go and support them in their ministry. It's something they do every year and look forward to us coming. So I hope you can come. We will take a van here. It will depart at 6.15. Uh, we have quite a few events coming up in the next week. We have ambassadors this coming uh, Thursday. Uh, some ladies are going to Pigeon Ford for Transform. Our blood drive is Monday, September the 11th, and the ladies' Bible class will resume uh, September the 12th. And then uh, let's don't forget about Friends and Family Day. We look forward to that. That'll be September the 17th. Please invite all your friends and family to come. Uh, we'll uh, meet that morning and then have a fellowship meal. And then after uh, the fellowship meal, we'll return here uh, for a singing that afternoon at 1 p.m. Make sure that you invite all your family and friends to come and attend that. All right. So let's begin tonight uh, with the song. <coughs> hide me, O oh my Savior, hide me in thy holy place, resting there beneath thy glory. Let me see thy face. Hide me, hide me. Oh, blessed Savior, hide me. Oh, Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with thee. Hide me when the storm is raging or life's trouble cease. Like a dove on ocean's billows, oh, let me fly to thee. Hide me, hide me, oh, blessed Savior, hide me. Oh, Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with thee. Hide me when my heart is breaking with its weight of woe. When in tears I see the comfort thou canst alone bestow. Hide me, hide me, O oh blessed Savior, hide me, O oh Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with thee. Our guest speaker in just a few minutes, and Eli's going to introduce him to us, is going to talk to us about how to follow Jesus in prayer. 
And so the songs uh, we've selected tonight have to do with prayer. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor? As a shield today, oh, how praying rests a weary. Prayer will change the night today. So when life seemed dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When you meet with great temptation. Did you think to praise by his dying love and merit? Did you claim the Holy Spirit as your guide and stay? Oh, how praying rests a weary prayer will change the night today. So when life seemed dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When your heart is filled with anger, did you think to praise? Did you plead for grace, my brother, that you might forgive another? had crossed your way. Oh, how praying rests a weary prayer will change the night today. So when life seemed dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When sore trials come did you think to pray when when your soul is sorrow well I'm all key and everything you gotta advance the slides oh how praying rests a wind Prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. Roland did such a good job last week uh, reading for us. Uh, I want to read just a little bit more this evening. Uh, if you open up your Bibles to the book of Second Peter. We're going to be looking at chapter 1 for our devotional time this evening. I really just want the words to speak to us tonight, and then I want to bring your attention to three phrases uh, that are in the passage that I want to highlight, and then we'll wrap it up in prayer this evening. 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. 
Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when when we told you about the coming of our Lord Savior, Jesus, in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin with the human will, but prophets, through human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Real quick, I want to draw your attention to uh, verse 4 and the word participate. Uh, The word participate. Uh, One of the students walked in uh, this evening with a Harry Potter book, and I used to love a good fiction book when I was in elementary school because you could be in math class or whatever and in school, but in my book, right, I'm on a dragon or I'm in a faraway place, right? And then then you shut your book and you're right back to reality. What's so great about the Bible is that we are, are participating in the story that is Scripture, right? We don't close the Bible and escape being a Christian, Right? The stories are a part of our faith, they are a part of our being, and they should be a part of our daily lives. We are participating in God's story. In verses 5 and 10, I want to direct you to the word, make every effort. This is something that Paul rep- repeated over and over and again. I just think it is so important as a church and as an individual, as Christians, going about our daily lives that... Um, as we've committed to following Jesus, that we're making every effort to do so. When, when I coach in sports, I always ask the kids, I say, I just need your effort and your attitude. Right? I just need effort and attitude, and I can coach the rest. Right? The one thing that, that n- has no effect that only you decide each and every day when you wake up is your effort and your attitude. No one can change that about you. And finally, in verse 19, I really, really enjoyed, as he was concluding, he talks about the until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What is he talking about? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Paul is telling us that we need to be participating in, Right in the gospel message. We need to be preaching and sharing the gospel message, making every effort until the very end of time, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, we read, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So until that sun continues to shine and until Jesus comes back one day in all of his glory, we have to continue as individuals, as Christians, and as a church to do our very best to live as he would have us to live, to preach and to teach and to share the gospel in the ways that he would have us to do it and give our very best effort until that day. Guys, I want to encourage you with that message this this midweek service. And if you would, I'll close in prayer and we'll go to our classes. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for this day. Father, I'm so thankful for the people that are gathered here in our building this evening. I'm thankful for the community that is the church here in Franklin and for all the work and the hard work that goes on here. Father, I just ask that you continue to bless uh, our time together as we retreat to our classrooms, as we open up your word that we try to learn and to glean and to apply what we're reading and learning uh, this evening. 
Father, we just ask that you, that you keep us safe during this time. Brother, I'm, uh, Father, I'm so thankful for our brother Darwin, that he's made the trip to be here tonight. I pray that he is a blessing to those that are here this evening, that as he preaches and teaches from your word, uh, that once again, that we can grow from his message. Father, once again, just ask that you watch over us as, as we leave here this evening, as we go out to finish the rest of this week, doing our very best and with, with all of our effort, right, to glorify you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Uh, and I bring you, there it is, there it is, all right. I bring you greetings from the Hillsborough Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, as, as Eli said, uh, um, it, he and I spent quite a bit of time together in the fall uh, working through Christian ethics, which, which is a, a really interesting concept and, and, and uh, content, especially considering the, the world that we live in and, and, and some of the ways that we've missed uh, and being as Christian as we could have be could be in our in our past. So so it was a very interesting class. Uh, I think it's probably the hardest class I had in that program. I fin when are you finished? Are you done? Okay okay. So I finished in May. So but it was probably that dude had us reading so many books it was ridiculous. You know the class is gonna be tough when the professor gives you a book that he wrote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but but it, it was a good class, so I'm honored to be here uh, with you all tonight. So it's my understanding. So I'm grateful to Eli and your leaders and, and uh, Brother McCarley for allowing me to to be here uh, and to grace uh, in this pulpit and to be able to stand and teach and and, and preach to you on tonight. Uh, it's my understanding that that you all have been working through uh, following Jesus through p prayer, and and particularly in the book of Matthews. Uh, and, and I'm excited about that. I, I, I will take a different approach to prayer uh, because I'm not really sure what they already taught, but I know they already taught the Lord's Prayer. 
Uh, so, so I want to take a different approach to prayer uh, and, and, and really take you to the fifth chapter of Matthew, uh, the fifth chapter of Matthew, uh, the fourth verse. If you know anything about the book of Matthew, you know, chapters five through seven. How y'all doing up here? Y'all good? Yeah, all right, good, good. I like being close to the youth. You guys give me energy. Uh, if, if you know anything about uh, the, the uh, chapters five through seven is, is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and, and Jesus uh, really does a, a great job, a perfect job, actually, of explaining the law and even talking about how when he comes, he comes to perfect the law, fulfill the law. Uh, but in the fourth verse of the fifth chapter, he uh, says, and it's what they call the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I wanted to spend some time on that one verse. And he said, well, well, well how in the world does blessed are those who mourn how does that have anything to do with prayer? Well, if you really uh, break down and look at the, the word mourn, the, mo the word mourn is what we call a calling out, a calling out to God. Uh, and, and when I think about the idea of prayer, I see prayer as being a conversation or a calling out to God. So Jesus is actually telling us, blessed are those who call out to God or who mourn, and, and it has a, uh, a very intentional connotation. Those who are mourning are those people who may be dealing with difficulty or grief or anything of, the, of that nature. But he says, blessed are those who call out to God in their difficult situation, for they will be comforted. Uh, so let's, let's look at this, this text. And if I had to give the sermon a title, I will give you the title, I'm Heartbroken. I'm Heartbroken. And, and, and then we'll walk through this. So, so the idea of heartbroken, uh, when, you think, uh, when I think of the term, uh, if this really kind of brings me to tears when I think and I hear heartbroken because I cannot really truly hear the word and not think of the experiences in which I have been heartbroken. This summer for me was an extremely difficult summer. Uh, specifically the month of, of July. Actually, it was exciting. I had, had uh, kind of extreme highs and lows in the summer. Exciting because after 20 years, I left leading schools and decided to move in to ministry full time, uh, but also uh, very difficult as I lost my uncle and one of my closest friends. Uh, and my, my, I, I was a caregiver for my friend as he passed away, uh, 42 years old, uh, from congestive heart failure. So when I think of the idea of heart, heart broke, broke, being heartbroken, I think of those type of moments. Uh, and, and, and I can feel in my life, I, I remember times when my life is kind of shattered in pieces and, and remember times when, when, I, when the pain that I was dealing with kind of paralyzed me. Uh, and there I remember times when I just wanted you to stop. Anybody ever been in a situation where you, you just wanted the pain or the grief or the mourning to stop? Some, I see some people have, and that's okay if you don't raise your hand. I nod to get you there too. Thank you. I appreciate that. So there's times when it just happens. And, 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 and the truth of the matter is you are in one of three places. You are either you have experienced heartbreak and you're just overcoming it. Uh, you are walking towards heartbreak because life just does that. Or you are right in the middle of a difficult situation right now. So I hope this lesson will, will, will help you, especially those who may be quietly calling out to God or quietly dealing with a broken heart. So the Bible says that, that God has an answer for those who mourn, and he says, those blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, I want you to understand this concept. Mourning or grief are essential to your health. They're essential to, to your health. If you never mourn or if you never grieve, chances are one of three things are happening. One, you're out of touch with reality. Two, you're out of touch with your emotion. Or three, which is the most heartbreaking, you just don't love. If you've never experienced mourning or grief, you're probably in one of those three situations. And, and because we mourn a number of different things. We mourn loss, which are the bad things that happen to us. And we also mourn disappointment, which are good things that we hope to happen that didn't happen to us. And as Christians, we mourn our sins. 
We mourn our suffering. We mourn the friends that we have or loved ones that we have that don't know Jesus. We mourn the social evils of the world. We mourn the oppression that we see around the world. So, so there are just times when we, all, when we just have to mourn, and I'm here to tell you that mourning is essential to your health. See, the, the ver- I need you to know that in verse 4, verse 4 is tied in to verse 3 where it says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, is a compliment to the first. What do you mean by that? Verse 3 is an intellectual acknowledgement that I am undone. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That that means that I recognize that without God, I'm nothing. My spirit understands that if I don't have God in my life, then I don't have anything. So that's, that's verse number three. And then verse number four is the emotional aspect of the same thing. So what it says is, is that in verse three it says, I'm done. And then in, in verse four it says, woe is me. I'm mourning. I cry out to God because I recognize that I am nothing without him. And when I recognize that, I just have to say, God, help me. So verses three and four uh, uh, are dealing with this idea of mourning. And all mourning, just get this, please accept this as your operational definition. All mourning is a crying out to God, saying, God, I need you. I don't know about you, but I need God each and every day. Every morning I work out, wake up, I need God. And here's the beautiful piece. The Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted is what theologians call a Semitic idiom. And what it means is that God will do the comforting. It's similar to what we see in Isaiah 61, which promises comfort and consolation as a part of the Messiah's work. So here's the blessing. The blessing is, is that blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because God will comfort them. Isn't that good? I don't know how you feel about that, but that's good. So when I pray and I call out to God because I'm dealing with difficulty, I don't have to worry about my calling out because it's not just anybody that's going to come for me. God takes control and will come for me. Now, some of you are saying, okay, I get it. It's essential to mourn. And and I want you to, our youth especially, I want you to get, don't get caught up in the narrative that everything, you'll just get over everything. See, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a time right now, Brother Mason, we live in a time right now where, we, where, where social media kind of runs the world. You know, you got Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, other chats. I don't know what they are, but you got all of those things going on. And what happens is, uh, and I'm just talking to the youth, but, but, but this, this, this is relevant to us all. What happens is, is that uh, because... We live in this life of social media. That means that we live in a life that's filtered. So free people really never show who, what, who they are or what they're dealing with. As a matter of fact, you know it. When you take a picture, I remember as, as a middle school principal, I had a, I had a young lady come to me and she said, Dr. Mason, let's take a picture together. And I said, all right. And she said, okay, here we go. One, two, three. And she took the picture. And I said, all right, cool. So we took a picture. And she sat there for maybe two or three minutes. And she was looking at her phone, looking at her phone. And then she started messing with the picture. She, and she, she, she put it, I said, I said, girl, what is that? I said, well, what, what, what are you doing? Why, why, why? I, I, my cheeks are not rosy like that. And she said, Dr. Mason, it's a filter. And I said, well, why do we need a filter? Aren't we good the way that we are? She said, Dr. Mason, everybody puts a filter on their picture. And then she waited another two or three minutes. We're standing there dismissal. And she waited another two or three or four or five minutes. And then I saw her post the picture. And then I saw her delete the picture. And I said, well, what happened? You put a filter on us so we can look good. Well, why in the world did you delete the picture so quickly? And she said, I didn't get enough likes. (laughs) She's used to living in a world where every emotion comes with a filter. 
Every picture comes with a filter. Well, guess what that does? That makes us live in a space that is not reality. And what it, what it encourages us to do is to live in a space where when we suffer difficulty, we don't show it. When we go through hard times, we don't show it. We only show the filtered part of our lives. And, and what ends up happening is, is that we get this, this uh, we have this bad uh, notion of how we deal with difficulties because every time we go through something, we have to show people that we can just get over it. And the truth of the matter is this. Some things you don't get over. You only get through. You got to just go through it. So I'm saying, so, so don't get caught up in this narrative that, that everything is always okay. Sometimes you're going to get to school and you're not going to like it because there's going to be somebody at your locker talking about your shoes or somebody stole your boyfriend or your girlfriend and all those type of things. And there's going to be moments where you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't really like this. Even in those moments, listen, God wants you to cry out. God is, God is attentive to every single moment of our life, even our smallest details. God even knows what hairs you have on your head, even the ones that are dyed. <laughs> so you don't get some things you just got to go through. It. So, so, so this is what normally happens, and, and stay with me, church. Normally because we live this, this filtered life and we're so used to just answering things, you know, we, you know, we come to church and we even do it in church. We were talking about it yesterday in our faculty, in our staff meeting. I was working with the staff at the church, and we were dealing with some things, and, and we were talking about, uh, we're reading a book together. I'm leading us to a book together called The Way of the Shepherd. And when we, and we go through the way of the shepherd, we will start talking about one of the, one of the concepts in the book is uh, take, um, uh, knowing your sheep and knowing the, the shape of your flock. And, and I asked the staff, I said, well, how do we know how our flock are? And when we got into the conversation a little bit, Eli, they started to say things like, well, we try to check up on them and all those type of things. And one of, one of our ministers was really honest. He said, you know what? We got to be a little bit more intentional about that. He said, because sometimes I say, how you doing? And I'm so busy that I really hope everybody says okay. Because I don't have a moment to stop by and, and listen to their issues or listen to their concerns. So, so what ends up happening is, because we live in that kind of society, we live in a place where we do one or two things. We either repress our emotions, meaning that we unconsciously block them out of our mind because we, we have come to the point to believe nobody wants to hear it. Or we, or we either repress or we uh, suppress our emotions, meaning that consciously we say, I'm not dealing with that. Well, guess what? If you are repressing your emotion or if you're suppressing your emotion, in both of those situations, you are in denial. And let me tell you a secret. The things that will kill you are not just what, they, your, your body can be killed not only by what you put in it, but it can also be killed from the inside out. We have many people in churches right now who are 40, 50, 60 years old uh, in age, but are 15, 16, 17 in maturity. And the reason is because they didn't deal with the things that may have caused them to grieve. They didn't call out to God in those moments. Now, I, I, I've set the context. So, so let me, let, let me give, deal with the text because you want to hear about the text. So the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I told you that God will do the comforting. So the question is, well, how does God comfort us? That's the answer. That's what, what does God do? And how does God comfort us? Here's your four, first point, and you can write this down. When we are in tough situations, difficult situations, mourning, God draws near to us. Oh, I love that so much. God draws near to us when we are in our, most tough, in our toughest situation. How do I know that? Go to Psalms, the 34th chapter. In verse 18, Psalms, the 34th chapter. In verse 18. And when you get there, you'll find something that, that sounds like this. I don't know what translation that you're reading, but the New uh, American Standard Bible says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed. When you are heartbroken, God is near. In my spirit, I'm just shouting 
because I understand, I'm, I'm beginning to understand what it means when he says, when, when Jesus says, blessed are those who cry out to God, for he will do the comforting, for they will be comforted, because what I understand is that when I'm in my most difficult situation, God is near. Some of you saying, well, isn't God always near? Of course he is. But what this text is saying, what the psalmist is saying in chapter 34, it illuminates God's ability and desire to hear us in our dark, darkest moments. It illuminates his ability and his desire to save us when our spirits are weak. What, what kind of God would we serve if he only wanted to hear from us? when things were going well. That doesn't even sound like a good God, does it? So when we say things and when we get into our spaces and we think that in our prayer life we can't share our darkest moments with God, we're not giving God enough credit. Because the Bible says that it's in your darkest moments when you cry out that God comes close to us. So that's the first thing, God draws near. And then the next thing is, well, 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 the question you have to ask, well, if he draws near, what does that look like? What does drawing near look like? Go to Psalms 147 and verse 3. I know some of you saying, well, why he's using Old Testament scriptures, uh, but, but, but this is a New Testament text, and you're right. But what I know about scripture is that God is the same God in the Old Testament that he is in the New Testament. So if the Bible said he did it to the children of Israel or with the nation of Israel or they sang it in the Psalms because that's who he is, he's true to his character. So if he did it then, he'll do it again now. Psalms 147 chapter around the third verse says, it says, praise the Lord for it's good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Keep reading with me. It says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Verse 3 said, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Watch this. What does that mean? So the first thing we know is that when God, when we cry out to God, that God becomes, comes close to us. And then we also know that when he comes close, he does something even better. What does he do? He becomes close to us and he binds up our wounds. Eli, would you come in for a second? I usually, I, I, I should have brought an ace bandage with me, but today you're just going to have to be my jacket. Okay, I'm going to show you. So this is what it's saying. I cry out to God. And what God does is he comes close to me. Now, if I'm wounded, let's say Eli's arm is wounded. Then the Bible says then he binds up our wounds. That means he protects us. He wraps our wounds like you with an ace bandage or, or any time that you had an open cut. So here it is. God comes close, and then he binds up our wounds. Well, then the question is, is that what does God bind our wounds up with? I just told you. He can only bind our wounds up with who he is because God is consistent and he's true to his character. So when God binds up our wounds, he binds up our wounds with his characteristics of peace. He binds up our wounds with his characteristics of love. He binds our wounds with his characteristics of, of mercy and of grace, and he nurtured us. So when God binds up our wounds, hear me and hear me well, you are better off with a wound that is binded by God than if you had never had a wound at all. Because when he, when he wraps us, he wraps us in his perfect love. So the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because they will be comforted. Who will comfort them? God. How does he comfort them? He brings them close and he takes their broken hearts and their wounds and he binds them up with his grace, his love, his perfection. I'm so glad that I serve the type of God that hears my cry. But not only does he hear my cry, he comes close and then he fixes me better than I was. And not, 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 not he fixes me. I, a broken arm wrapped with God and is better than a man who never had a broken arm because our God only fixes things perfectly. Y'all here with me tonight? All right, get my jacket back, Eli. 
Now it's going to be all wrinkled. So God draws near to us. He draws close to us when we cry out. But that's not the only thing he does because we're talking about prayer. What else, what else does God do? What else does God do? God also gives us each other to help us along our journey. Stay with me. God gives us Christians to support us when we are dealing with our issues. We are not meant to grieve or to mourn in isolation. We're meant to grieve and to mourn in community. Y'all hear me? See, God is so good that if he wanted to, he could have given each and every one of us to our own island. He's that big of God. But God decided that man needed man. Why did God decide that man needed man? Because God values communion. How do I know that? Because at the beginning of, in Genesis, what happened is you have Adam and Eve and they're in the, in the garden and, and they are in perfect communion with God and then sin comes in. And when sin happens in chapter 3, they break this communion with God. And the whole rest of the Bible is about God's plan to restore man back in communion with him. So God values communion, which means he, can, he values community. So God, when we're, diff when we're going through diff difficult things, God gives us not only himself, but he gives us each other. Go to Romans, the 12th chapter in verse 9. Anytime I start to talk and people start looking at me funny, I know what that means. Go to the Bible. Verse 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Cleave to what is good. Be devoted to one another with brotherly love. Prefer one another in honor. Do not be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. But keep going. This is what I want you to hear. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Watch this. Watch, watch what, 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 what Paul tells the, Roman, uh, the people in Rome. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Don't be haughty, but, uh, but associate with the lowly. Do not pretend to be wiser than you are. What does Paul say? Paul's directions, his command to the church in Rome is that when you're happy, I'm happy with you. And when you weep, I'm weeping with you. And why is that important? Because it shows us that when we're going through our difficulties, when we cry out to God, not only does he come, to help us, but he also puts us in a community where we can help one another. First Thessalonians 5 and 11 says, build up one another. So, so, so some of you are, are sitting here and, and, and arrogance might be, might be coming in your shoulder. You're thinking to yourself, well, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not in a situation where I'm mourning. I don't, I, I, I'm good. I'm all right. But this message is for everyone. Why? Because either you're going through pain and you need to be comforted, or you need to be comforting others who are dealing with pain. Because that's the commandment to the people of God. But when, you, when, when you're comforting people, like, I want to give you a few suggestions to avoid. Are y'all y'all still hearing me? Just nod your head. It's not. See, at Hillsboro, we, 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 got, we got this thing going. I told them, I said, you're welcome to amen and shout and everything. But if you don't do anything, just, just nod your head. So I know you're still there. Because if you don't nod your head, then I think the point isn't there, then I stay longer, and then it'll be 8, 30, 9 o'clock, and you're like, I wish he would eat. No, y'all just walk out. I get it. <laughs> so, so, so here it is. So, so God says, says weep with those, I mean, rejoice with those who rejoice, and then uh, weep with those who weep. Now, I want, I want to give you uh, some, some advice on how to do that well. The first thing I, I, want, I think that we need to work on as a church because I know that, that we are supposed to comfort one another. But sometimes, if I'm being honest, Brother Mason, and Brother Mason over here, this is my daddy. I could say daddy, but I'm going to say Brother Mason. Uh, sometimes, you know, as they say, as the young kids used to say, sometimes church folks are the worst folks. Because when it comes to doing the job of comforting, 
we do a poor job on it. it the truth of the matter is this. Well, McCarley, some people can't visit the sick. People, they, they'll be more sick when you leave. <laughs> because they don't have the right attitude. But, but, and I'm going to tell, tell you why. The first thing, write this down. If you want to help each other go through when they're dealing with difficulty, here's the first thing. Never minimize somebody else's pain. Never rush. Never minimize, minimize somebody else's pain. And never rush people to healing. If I'm dealing with something, let me deal with it. Don't say, well, I know you got a little problem this week. No, my problem's not little. It may be little if you're thinking about my, but to me, my problem is big. Like so the, the, the man said, uh, I hear you going into a little surgery. He said, uh, uh, my surgeries are always big. I don't care if they're fixing a toenail, but surgery is big. So never minimize other people's pain. Never. It, it, I would encourage us to avoid rushing people to healing. Show it grace and stop trying to talk people out of their feelings. Let me give you an example that just, I'll just be real. So my, my, my wife and I, um, back before we had our son, our son was born in 2015, so before we had our daughter in 2011, and then after we had our daughter, we suffered two miscarriages. Uh, and uh, the second one was later in the pregnancy. So she had to go through uh, a, a pretty um, tough surgery um, with, our, with, our, with our, the, the child that we lost. And I remember being really struggling so much with that. And, and crying and praying and, and, and really just struggling with the idea. You know, I, I worked before I went to Innsworth, I worked in inner city schools and I see I saw these people who were not taking care of their children and they, and, and they had six or seven or eight or nine kids. And here I am, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm a pretty good guy. I love my wife, I'm faithful to her. We, we got a pretty good home. And here we are suffering a second miscarriage. And, I, and to be totally honest, I had to talk to God about it. I wanted to know, like, God, what is it exactly that you're trying to teach me here? Why are we going through this? But I remember, I remember sharing this story with uh, our church home. And, and a lady came to me, and she said, well, I know you, are, are you guys are struggling and, and dealing with it and all this. And she said something that just blew my mind. She said, well, but at least you have your daughter. I said, at least when I'm going through my difficulty, don't at least me. Don't at least me because, yes, I'm, I'm grateful to have my daughter, but right now in this moment, I'm mourning not having the daughter I just lost. But sometimes we become so insensitive and we want to make sure that we are, well, God, is it, we, I know God will take care of me. Right now, I just need you to be a person to listen and pray with me. And don't try to rush me out of my emotions. It's like, it's, it's like Job's friends. Job's friends came and they sat with him for seven days, which is customary for, for, for the Jewish home. Seven days, they called it sitting shiva. And, 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 and they, sat, they sat for seven days. And they didn't say a word, Eli. But as soon as they started talking, they said the wrong thing. So what I'm telling you is comfort people well because healing takes time. And God uses us to comfort those who are mourning. What are we talking about? We're talking about prayers being answered. Because, the, because crying out to God is a prayer. And this is the way that he answered us. We said, since God uses us to take care of each other during our difficulty, I just believe we ought to be good at it. We ought to rid ourselves of judgment. judgment and fill ourselves with love and grace so that we can grow. Well, how, how else does God comfort us? Well, he comforts us with one another. God uses our pain to help others. Do you know when my ministry started, this ministry particularly, my ministry started, and I started thinking about it differently, differently 
when I suffered through some things. When I lost, when I lost that we had the second miscarriage. And then in 2019, I don't have, I don't, I, I had my son was born and he's perfect now and he was perfect then and he had to have a, a, a emergency brain surgery because he had a, 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 a cluster of veins that were that misformed in his mind and, and you know the day before he went he had a seizure at school at four years old and had to be rushed into the hospital you know the day before he had that seizure you know what I preached Proverbs 3 trust God oh <laughs> God sure put me on. He, he called me on it, didn't he? And, 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 and we went through that. We went through the surgery, and my son is doing well. And, and you, if you, didn't, if you didn't know, if I didn't tell you, you would never know. He had the surgery, but it was a very invasive surgery. And it was at that moment when I realized my ministry has shifted. And it was a story of overcoming with my son. It was a story of going through two miscarriages. It was those stories that helped me minister to others. So God will use our pain to help us. Y'all looking at me funny, that means I need to go to Scripture. If we go to 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, and verse 4, it says, Blessed be God, blessed be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Watch this. Who comforts us. I told you he does it. Then I tell you that? Who comforts us all in all of our tribulations, why does God do it? That we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble by the same, by the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforted me in my darkest moments, but he comforted me with an expectation that because I'm his child and because he drew near to me and because he wrapped my he binded my wounds and he, because he comforted me, his expectation is, is that now I will pay it forward. And I will, and I love this, Brother McCarthy. Listen to what he says. He, didn't, he does, just does not say that we comfort them. He says that we comfort, that, that, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble by the comfort which ourselves are comforted by God. What does that mean? He says that the expectation is that children of God will comfort one another, but they will comfort one another in the same way that God comforted them. That's the way it needs to be done. So if you're trying to figure out how to help somebody, how did God help you? And that's the way in which you pay it for. So and then he goes on to say that the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So listen to me. So God uses our pain to help others. Sometimes our greatest ministry may come out of our deepest hurt. My secretary at Hillsboro, her and her husband, lead our grief ministry. And they started the ministry about seven years ago when they lost their son. And she tells me all the time that when I was, when I left Shredder Lane, and, and uh, I'm not going to get emotional thinking about this, when I left Shredder Lane and I came to Hillsboro, I was going to meet one of our leaders, at one of the leaders at Shredder Lane to drop off my keys. And she said, when you leave, she said, now this is my ministry, she said, but I have to share with you. I said, okay. She said, when you leave, say everything that you need to say including goodbye. And I said, why? why? She said, that matters so much. She said, anytime you walk away from a space, I learn, even if it's a small level of grief, you'll grieve a little bit. And the only way you can do it well is to bring closure. She said, when I, when I lost my son, you know, I learned about saying goodbye. She said, but when, when, I, when I retired as a crossing guard, she said, people thought I was crazy. She said, but I had stood on that corner for 15 years, and when I, in my last day, I told the tree, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. She said, because that was my way of leaving the space well. So what I'm telling you is, is that sometimes your greatest ministry may come out of your deepest hurt. I just encourage us to be a church that will allow people to minister from their hurt. Y'all still here? I see some heads. It's not the good times that uh, allow people to listen to us. 
It's adversity that gives us our greatest credibility. So I encourage you to use your pain, and sometimes you just will end up being a wounded healer. You may not, like I said, you, may, you, won't, you will never be the same, but you can still minister. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What a blessing. But I want you to watch this. Romans 8 says, for we know. But if you look at, somebody go to, I, I got, go, go to Romans 8, verse 25. Because I, I, I got to, you got to see this. Because we rushed to this verse, Eli, and, and, and when we rushed to this verse, sometimes we miss the blessing of knowing. When you get to Eli, if you don't mind, if you would just read out loud. Verse, verse 25, what does it say? But if we hope, uh -huh. hope for what, we have, for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Okay, keep going. Keep going, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh -huh. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through words and scrums. Uh -huh. Go ahead. He, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh huh. In accordance with the will of God. Yeah. And we know that in all. Stop God. there. Stop there. Listen to this. The Bible says in verse 28, for we know that all things work for those who, for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But the sweet part about the knowing comes in verse 26 and 27. How do we know that all things work? Because the Spirit. God the Spirit talks to God the Father about what we're unable to talk to him about. And then God the Spirit aligns our prayers, the things that are in our heart, into God's will. And then it ends up working in our favor because God had a conversation with God about something that we were unable to talk to him about. So why does it work? Because by the time we know it all works, because God fixed it. When God talked to God about the things that you wanted him to talk to him about, but you didn't even know you needed to talk to him about it. For we know all things work for good because God is in conversation. So it's working together because God starts the conversation and God finishes it. So we ought to be willing to mourn, to cry out because we are blessed are comforted as a result. So you could be a wounded healer. And then the last thing that God gives us when we mourn and we cry out to him in our prayers is he gives us the hope of heaven. God gives us the hope of heaven. And, and, and that's not all. If you go to Revelation, the 21st chapter, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the hurt first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there were no more seas. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven said, Look, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their father. And then verse 4 says, And God shall. Wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither shall there be any more sorrow, no more crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. So God says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, how does he do it? He comes close to us, and then he binds up our wounds, and then he gives us us to help each other through our difficulties. Yeah, and he, he even allows the things that we go through to help others go through what, they, what we just went through. But then he gives us this beautiful, beautiful hope of heaven. He says, if none of those things were, were here is where your hope lies, is that there will be a day when we'll see him in peace and there'll be no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. There is comfort in God. 
There is comfort in your mourning. So here's my request. Please don't hurt in silence. Cry out. Give it to God. And don't just give him some of it. Give it all to him. He needs all the pieces to put you back together again. You know we do sometimes... We say, we, even in our prayers, and we know God knows our heart, we say, God, I want you to help me with this. But then we only give him a little bit of the situation, and then we go to work or to, with our wives, or whatever, and then we start trying to work it all out. God can't put your broken heart together, back together, if you don't give him all the pieces. So when you're dip, go, deal, deal, dealing with difficulties, give it to God, and he needs all the pieces to to. To, 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 to put you back together. Now, I know with some people right now, the devil is coming in you right now. He's saying, you don't need no help. Just forget about it. You will get over it. No, you won't. You will only get over it when you cry out to God because that's when your comfort begins. So, Jesus in the book of Matthew talks about prayer. And I find it interesting that one of the ways that he's encouraged us to talk to God is to cry out and to mourn. And then he, he gives us his beautiful comfort. God will do the comfort. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's pray. Dear most righteous and heavy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. We come here right now asking you to walk with us in our lives. We, we, we know that you're here, but we also know it's good to just invite you to walk with us, Lord. And we pray that, that we will just continue to walk towards you and be, be in your way and, and, and to be comforted by who you are. We ask a special prayer for the Franklin con uh, congregation who is studying prayer. And we know that there's so many things that we can talk to you about. And we pray that we will remember, remember to talk to you even in our darkest hours because we understand that when we cry out to you, you will comfort us. Lord, please love us and protect us in the way that only you can. Help us. Heal us. Comfort us. Guide us in the way that you only you can, Lord. We need you in our lives. From the youngest member of this congregation to the eldest member of this congregation, we all need you in our lives. So we welcome you in and we cry out to you to be our Savior and our guide. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.